I watched the Johnny Menzel documentary on Netflix. I would strongly encourage you to do the same. Now, what I'm not going to do is spoil it for you. I think you pretty well know the story of Johnny Menzel. There is some stuff in there that you would not otherwise have known. I'm going to start with the positives, okay? Easily, the first and biggest takeaway from the Manziel documentary is Billy Lucci looks immaculate. The Texag studio looks immaculate. I have been gaining clout all over Nashville all week by reminding people that we did Lake Kick in the studio that is prominently featured in this Manziel documentary. So good for us and good for Billy Lucci. I was texting with him last night while I was watching it, and he, I asked him, when did you film all this? He said, about a year ago. I think it was between week one and week two a year ago. So some of the positives I took away, and I strongly encourage you guys to watch this, it's unfiltered. For better or for worse, I don't really care if I like someone or don't like someone. I don't really care if I approve of or don't approve of your attitude on life. Just be authentic with me. At least I want to know the real you. Well, there is no doubt that you get the real Johnny Manziel here. You may not get the entire depth of the story because it's only a little over an hour. and You would need... You would need a 10-part docu-series of hour-long episodes to really tell the Johnny Menzel story. I think they do a good job of skimming the surface of it, uh, but they, they don't really dive too far deep into any one particular issue or topic. But I, got, I just got so wrapped up in remembering what the pre-NIL world was like. And Christy Dosh, who does great work, I would encourage you to follow her on Twitter, she put out this factoid, and they talk about it in the documentary, we're in the NIL world now, so if you're like 10 years old, 12 years old, you've pretty much only known a world where players can make money. And 10 years from now, we will be further immersed in a world where it's just commonplace for high-profile star college athletes to be millionaires. What in the case 10 years ago when Johnny Menzel was in College Station? A bunch of folks were making millions, not the players. And I have never been a person who believes that the average college player's value is quite what they think it is. But there are certain players, Tim Tebow and Johnny Manziel, Cam Newton, those are three of them, whose value is millions of dollars. While they're in college, they, they should be millionaires. That would be their true market value. I want you to listen to this. It, this is wild to the point where it sounds like a typo, but it's not. In 2011, this is according to Christy Dosh. This is her stat. In 2011, the total number of reported donor contributions for the entire SEC was about $252 million. That is the entire conference, about a quarter of a billion dollars in donations. In 2013, Texas A&M alone reported $740 million in donations. That's the year after the Manziel explosion happens. Just ungodly amounts of money. Let me repeat this. The entire SEC in 2011, 252 mil. A&M, the year after Manziel blows up and wins the Heisman, $740 million. They blow up Kyle Field and start renovating it. That place looks totally different today than it did when he was there, largely because of him. I, I had one of you hit us up earlier today and say, would we have ever even been able to afford Jimbo Fisher if Johnny Manziel hadn't happened? Would this job be as attractive to someone like Jimbo Fisher if Johnny Manziel wouldn't have happened? You, you could do the rest of this show and then some just on the impact he had there. But the further removed you get from the pre-NIL era, the wilder it looks. Like, that already sounds pretty wild. And, and to a lot of people, it was ridiculous at the time that... He had to sneak around, as you see in the documentary. I mean, they're having to take private flights to go do autograph sessions to make 30K, 40K, 50K. It's not illegal. It's just against NCAA rules. And they had a really good system devised for that. Nate. What a soldier Nate was, by the way. And so nowadays, you just, you just cash in on that. Not back then. And so, I mean, imagine listening to that. Another generation from now. Imagine in 2040. You listen to that story, and you look at those numbers. A&M, in one year, raises three times the amount the entire conference did two years earlier, really off the back of one guy from Kerrville, Texas. One guy. Just a staggering, staggering amount of money made off of one person. So 
there, there are several things in this doc that a lot of people are talking about. I'm going to let you form your own opinions. But um, like I said, I appreciate the authenticity. It's really ultimately sad, though. To me, uh, the way I came away thinking about it is I remember how entertained I was when I watched him. But when you get the curtain pulled back, and he's on this thing. I mean, he, he is an integral part of it. He's on the record. He does not pull any punches. Uh, but he, he also not really apologetic. He's just presenting his point of view. It's kind of sad to me, only because I'm looking at potential. And as great as he was, the dude never watched film, even in the NFL. He just admits it. I never watched film. Zero minutes spent watching film. They could track it on his iPad when he was with the Browns. Never watched film. Didn't do it in college. Cliff Kingsbury talked about it, former OC. We just knew we had a star. You kind of you got to treat stars a little bit differently. The old Jimmy Johnson approach, but for college football. But man, like, I know some of you get anxiety when you even think about traveling. And you want every I dotted, you want every T crossed. Like Tim Watts, buddy of mine, uh, I think he lives down in Birmingham still. Who knows what Tim does these days? But that he travels a lot and tries to pressure me to travel a lot. That dude will have an itinerary that is longer than the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he'll know every single thing, every plane, every connection, um, every price point. Meanwhile... We got Johnny Manziel, a, a literal NFL quarterback, the day before a National Football League regular season game, decides to fly to Vegas, gets out there, and then just says, I figured I'd just get out there and find a commercial flight back. And then I realized, oh, the last flight direct to Cleveland from Vegas tonight's already left. Oh, well, let's just turn up for the night. And then the Browns let him go the next day. <laughs> like he went out there the day before a game and did not even, he did not even know how he was going to get back. And the sad part is, I just wonder what the guy would have been like with even a little discipline, with even a little commitment to the craft, because he was just naturally that gifted. That's why you're talking about an insane generational talent. He did what he did. He rewrote record books. He won the Heisman as a true freshman. He became a first-run NFL draft pick and had horrific habits had horrific work ethic, no dedication to the craft, at least in comparison to what other people uh, that would be considered his peers had. He just had God-given ability that was so far above and beyond, he kind of made up for it. But I, I, was, I was reading what Ryan Leaf said about it and his overall impression of it, and some people are taking away from this documentary that they exploited Johnny Manziel. By they, I mean the folks who made the documentary. Because this is not a story of redemption. It is not a rehabilitation story. Like if you go into most episodes of Behind the Music, you're used to seeing a band blow up and then they get sky high and then drugs and alcohol and, and jealousy and clicks and infighting take them down. But then at the end, there's the rebound. And about the last 10 minutes, it's about life after fill in the blank. And everyone's happy and everyone's got a wife and four kids and they're all, they're all well and good and they've all made up. That is not the Johnny Menzel documentary. His best friend in college, they haven't spoken since. Um, his dad and he were estranged for a long time and I guess things are okay there now because they, they showed him sitting on a porch. But I think what stood out the most to folks who have watched this is a lot of the issues it sounds like he had, he still has. And so a lot of people have looked at this and said, okay, if you don't have a redemption portion at the end of the story arc and you tell this story, you're exploiting him. I didn't necessarily see it that way. I get the point they're making. But my counterpoint will be your job's to tell the story. It's not Hollywood. You don't always get to write the kind of ending you want. And also Johnny Manziel's not even 30 years old yet. So you haven't seen his ending. There's still several, God willing, there's still several chapters in his book to where maybe you're watching part two of that thing seven years from now, and it picks up where this documentary leaves off, and he's sitting there openly telling you about how, oh, I was still a disaster at the end of that documentary. Now look how far I've come. I, it's part fun to me. It's part sad to me. But I also, when I saw it conclude and the credits start to roll, all I thought about was to be continued. It didn't say it on the screen, but that is very much to be continued for me.